that the line outside is absolutely, completely insane. So the fact that you made it in here, uh, I salute you guys. This is pretty spectacular. Hey folks, just one quick, quick tool jam ground rules for those you haven't heard yet. Uh, please take a moment to silence all of your pagers and cell phones. All right, so we can, because we have a... Yeah, I know. <laughs> We're going old school, man. We're an old school franchise. Uh, number two, recording the panel is fine. We have no problem with you. We see a lot of people with cameras here. That's wonderful. But there will be some times where Tommy asks you to turn off your, your, your recording devices for certain parts of the panel. So without further ado, I'm going to transfer it to my friend Tommy Yoon and welcome to the Robotech panel. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, let's see. We're here for the to cover the future of Robotech. And uh, I am Tommy Yoon, President of Animation of Direct Harmony World USA. Uh, I've got here with me Steve Yoon. Yeah. Uh, he's uh, VP of New Media. He also co wrote uh, Robotech to Shadow Chronicles and uh, was the associate producer on Love the Live. And we have with us uh, Kevin McKeever. Kevin is our head of marketing, and he was also the associate producer on Carl Masick's Robotech Universe. And uh, also we have here with us a uh, nice surprise again. Oh. <laughs> hey, Frank Catalano, get a job. Uh, he was the voice of Rand, and of course, those of you who actually went through and watched all the Southern Cross episodes, uh, Dennis Brown. Uh, Anybody remember Dennis Brown? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I already know the new generation of toys about this, right? <laughs> and uh, he also worked on Captain Harlock, uh, Computer Warriors, Digimon, Cowboy Bebop, uh, and he also has a <coughs> book about his experience called Rant Unwrapped. Uh, do you want to talk about it? Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming on the 4th of July. Happy Independence Day to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> exciting is sometimes you do something and when you're in the middle of it you don't realize how special it was and working on the Robotech series we were all thrown into it we were all working late hours I'm sure you heard some of the stories or if you buy my book they're all in there um, I wanted to get it down and uh, Carl and I had talked about writing a book we never did it and I decided I wanted to work on something to kind of capture that experience, how we created the characters. It was a very unique experience, and um, so I decided to write a book about my character. And really, Rand Unwrap is really kind of a backstory on how I developed the character of Rand, how I kind of gave the kind of New York thing, and, you know, New York. <laughs> and, uh, it is true that a lot of the stuff that we did in the studio sometimes was improvised, some of it was written, some of it was improvised, and uh, we never improvised with the idea that it was going to make it to the air, but certainly the get a job line was one that uh, we improvised and somehow it got there. And I wanted to capture that in a book, the unique experience, and one of the things that was part of the journey for me uh, in creating this book was, I'm a Robotech fan just like you. I love this show. And I thank all of you because I really fell in love with the fans and that's how I learned about this show. He's got some footage he's going to show you today. When I took this, started this, I didn't know anything. Carl knew everything about who did what with who and all of that stuff. We didn't know the stories and it was through the fans that I learned about this show. And it started back in the 80s actually with those conventions. People were trying to, they sent me to, to uh, New York to be Rick Hunter. So he had an idea to have me dress up as Rick Hunter because I kind of looked like him. And the fans straightened me out real fast. That's why I love, I love you guys and I thank you all for being here and I'm very, very honored to be asked to be here. Thank you. There's actually an interesting story behind that, but uh, we're going to get to that in about maybe a few minutes because okay. uh, it's kind of buried in the presentation. But uh, I got a question for all of you. Uh, how many, how do all of you enjoy Robotech now? Uh, how many of you still have your old VHS tapes? Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. How many of you uh, are, have your prized shiny DVDs? Uh, now, how many of you guys just watch a digital streaming through Netflix and Hulu? 
It's all legal. Now. It's legal. So uh, it, it's, it's really interesting that we have a split three way, it seems like a split yeah. evenly three way. Um, although we did get an earful uh, uh, earlier last month because, oh, whoops, did I cover you already? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, uh, a lot of people noticed that uh, Robotech went offline last month. And everybody wondered whatever was going on with my Robotech fix, you know, for those of you who like to watch Robotech over the internet. Well, just to let you know, uh, it's only temporary. Right now, uh, it's just undergoing a shift into digital distribution arrangement, and it is uh, moving over to our new online distribution partner, and that is Lionsgate. And they will be handling it, uh, but it will all be transparent. It will come back on Hulu again. However, our online distributor for Hulu and YouTube, etc., will be Lionsgate. So uh, just hang tight, guys. You'll be able to see it for free with ad support again very soon. So. Woo! Woo! Now, uh, speaking of you old school guys, uh, this was the old way to watch it, which was either 21 DVDs previously for 80 films, <laughs> I got which that. had for yeah. 15 minutes of extras, or you had to track down dozens and dozens of VHS tapes. Uh, uh, it's luckily it's a lot easier to collect everything like now. Uh, one thing that the, uh, these sets don't get you are the, mo uh, the most recent extras. Uh, we had uh, last year covered uh, Carl Mason's Robotech Universe. This is our big documentary uh, in which we were talked about for the very first time uh, the making of Robotech, and that's available from Annie's box set and. Uh, Amy, our current distribution partner, uh, they've released this uh, box set. It's still available at stores. Uh, it's an excellent collection. Uh, the pricing on it is very good. Uh, you can get every single Robotech episode and 10 hours of extras uh, for under 100 bucks. And most stores are discounting these uh, very favorably, so you can find it probably at an even better price if you look online. Um, you, uh, the official uh, webpage for this is robotech.com slash dvd if you want more information about it. Uh, also, uh, the distribution of it, uh, you'll notice this is for you hardcore collectors who check every single SKU and even little minor changes between uh, reprintings. Is This fall, uh, the reprinting of this set will also have the Lionsgate logo on it as well, uh, reflecting our new distribution arrangement with Lionsgate Entertainment. So for those of you who have to have every single version ever made, uh, there you go. Thank you. Uh, now, um, uh, coming back to print media, uh, how many of you guys are huge fans of the Robotech RPGs? In high school, all right. Uh, <laughs> I, that's awesome that you were into it. Uh, there were a lot of fans who were both into uh, the Robotech RPGs back then, and there were people who were into the early Battletech printings because they loved the mecha, that, which is now quote-unquote unseen. Uh, they loved those type of mech games. Uh, however, a lot of people noticed that around 2000, all these games kind of went out of print. And uh, Kevin Sabita, who was one of our most longest time uh, Robotech supporters, he was very polite to Harmony Gold, uh, I how many of you heard this story before? Uh, okay, uh, Kevin Sambita took one look at Robotech 3000. How, how many of you know about Robotech 3000? Okay, I hear chuckles, so all right, two and two is coming together. And very politely told us, uh, thank you, it's been great, but uh, without saying the word jump the shark, we kind of knew what he meant. Uh, pretty much, uh, he said, thank you very much, but no thanks. And uh, that was the end of the original Robotech RPG. However, when Kevin found out about Robotech the Shadow Chronicles, he was like, oh my goodness, sign us back on board. And he really wanted to be part of Robotech again. And uh, they started working on the new Robotech RPGs, and uh, this is the result. Uh, we have them available in make size editions in large format, deluxe hardcover, and source books covering the entire series. And at first, the mega size seemed to be a bit of a hit. It kind of shook up uh, the industry a little bit. Everybody kind of complaining about the size. People said some people saying it's cool because it was reflecting the new trend of the Tokyo Pop size, the Takabon size. Uh, but then uh, there was something that happened in real life usage that people discovered is that because of the lightweight and size of the books, is when you often play with RPGs, you have your books open, so you have your stats out during gameplay with the lightweight books. Uh, you put them down on the table, and then uh, while you're playing, the book would slap shut because it was so small. 
And so uh, after all that uh, gameplay feedback, they've gone back to the large format size. So uh, starting with uh, uh, the new generation source book, they've returned to full uh, trade paperback size format, uh, along with the newest edition that just came out. We had uh, previewed this last year. Uh, this is the new Genesis Pitch source book. This is available now. And uh, uh, also new reprints, such as the Macross Saga, will be moving to the new larger size as well. Now, anybody remember RPG miniatures? This is one of the hardest to find Robotech collectibles ever. Uh, Palladium had produced this for a very, very short time. And this is something that uh, Battletech fans, uh, you know, cry in tears and, uh, uh, you know, leave us messages with uh, lots of colorful metaphors on the Harmony Gold answering machine. You know, why won't you let these exist? Whatever. And, uh, uh, to placate those fans who love the Unseen and also want, uh, you know, RPG miniatures for uh, Robotech gameplay, uh, uh, Palladium's role-playing game license was expanded to and renewed uh, to include uh, RPG gaming miniatures. Uh, this is just uh, this is a new deal that we just entered into this year. Um, how many of you remember Micro Machines? Uh, uh, this is something that fans have asked us, is a lot of fans love to collect Veritex, uh, but the pricing is somewhat high, you know, for the deluxe Veritex models. Uh, they're relatively expensive, and for all the different variants, people were starting to get burned out on high prices, and especially with the recession, and so, you know, Toynami has switched to the 1100 scale, bringing the prices down. Uh, however, people really want the super obscure mecha, such as you know the ghost uh, recon, uh, the ghost uh, recon, uh, what was it, uh, drone in the first episode, and all sorts of obscure mecha like uh, the cat's eye recon, which you know is not likely to be uh, seen in toy form because of the obscurity. However, for RPGs, uh, because of the relatively small size and cost, uh, this is something that Palladium is starting to do. They're covering everything uh, in the small uh, little size. Now, uh, when they... Uh, so here's an example. This is a CG mock-up. Uh, this is a cat mock-up of the Destroy Tomahawk. And this is going to stand about, a, about an inch and a half tall. Uh, about one to two inches? Oh, one to two inches? No, two to three inches. Two to three inches. Oh, uh, I stand corrected. Two to three inches tall. Uh, for these small scale gaming miniatures. So this, is, this covers the uh, uh, micro machine size category. So this is where we're going to get all sorts of uh, awesome obscure mecha, the stuff that you've seen in the episodes but wondered if it was ever going to be made. Even the, uh, the famed Jotun Valkyrie that was available, uh, that was seen only for the Force of Arms episode. You know, if you saw it in an episode, it's being made. So this is something that uh, uh, Palladium is working on right now. Now, there was a, a little bit of difficulty when you were starting work on this project. Uh, Palladium was undercapitalized. Uh, how many of you heard of the embezzlement scandal over at Palladium Books? Nope. Uh, okay, uh, this was something that was big in the news in uh, Michigan. It is uh, Palladium uh, had a scandal in which uh, the person who was their acting CFO had embezzled about half a million dollars from the company, and they had to take the guy to court. And they tried to get their money back, but the guy had already blown all, blown all the money. And so uh, the company was uh, in real big trouble and no fault of anyone, except for the guy who ended up uh, uh, getting convicted in court. But other than that, uh, the guys, uh, they were undercapitalized, meaning they were short on cash. And so what they ended up doing uh, about uh, now two months ago in May was they went to Kickstarter. How many of you heard of Kickstarter? How many of you have heard of Palladium's Kickstarter? All right. um, they went on Kickstarter to get all these toys funded because they were, they were primarily a publishing house of RPG books. They were ex they, their expertise was in print, but they needed to tool up, and they also needed to partner with a company named uh, Ninja Division, uh, who were real good experts at uh, manufacturing these miniatures. And it was going to cost a lot of money and uh, so, as a result, they went on. And uh, here, I'll show you the uh, uh, 
I'll show you the promotion that was placed on Kickstarter. Mecha pulled directly from the Rotec universe, used it in your RPG campaigns, or its fully realized standalone games of tactical combat. Rotec RPG Tactics allows players to take command of entire armies on the field of battle or a small squad in advanced skirmishes. This Kickstarter. Alright, um. Now, uh, they were undercapitalized, and for this project, when they went on Kickstarter to raise the plea for uh, development costs for this project, they wanted to raise $70,000. Now, uh, this was uh, the picture posted on Palladium's Facebook page after the Kickstarter closed. <laughs> uh, apparently, um, their Kickstarter campaign, instead of $70,000, they raised $1.4 million. Now, in return for raising this much money, this was Palladium's pledge in return, was uh, they met all sorts of stretch goals, and so in return, they were going to make it a modest set of mecha, and they were like, well, since you funded us to this tune, we're going to make all sorts of obscure, cool mecha, and so it's just going to be a basic set of your battle pods and, uh, you know, Veritex, but uh, with all the stretch goals made, they went all the way to the, you know, the VFX4 at the very last episode, so they're having it all done. So uh, it's going to be an awesome set when it becomes available in December. Uh, if you didn't fund, uh, if you didn't get it on the ground floor to fund it, it'll be available on a retail level. But those of you who fund it early, you're going to get an exclusive version of it. So, uh, but it's going to be uh, awesome nevertheless. Uh, actually, Steve worked on this. Can you uh, explain a little bit of your experience on this? I was mostly uh, dealing with Palladium on all the modeling for the uh, uh, figures and this was, we know our fans and we know our fans love to nitpick modeling of all the uh, robot designs and so we made sure to uh, hover over Palladium and make sure all the details were as accurate to the show as they could make it and so, uh, you know, um, being as nitpicky as all of you would be, just because you know I myself am a fan, and you know I expect my robots from you know 25 years ago to be exactly like uh, as accurate and detailed as possible. So you know that's uh, that's one for nitpicky fans, right? So uh, yeah, and you know there's a lot of uh, back and forth with Palladium uh, and us, and uh, you know fixing, you know, oh, this bolt doesn't belong here, or this curve is a little too much, and so there was a lot of going back and forth with uh, line art and models, but uh, we just wanted to make sure it passed the, uh, the hardcore fan test, so uh, we're hoping that when it comes out uh, this holiday season that you'll all be uh, pleasantly surprised at how detailed they are, so. Actually, there's a funny anecdote you reminded me of, is, uh, at first, uh, the modelers were like, oh no, the fans aren't going to pay that close attention to it because they're only two inches tall. I mean, are they going to nitpick to that level of detail? And on one of the <laughs> Facebook pages, uh, one of the modelers had leaked uh, one of the early designs before it had undergone like some revisions, and the guy didn't hear the end of it. The fans, like, you know, basically <laughs> read him the riot act. And so after that, you know, uh, you know, you were like, uh, yeah, you were right. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for the fan, and thank you fans, because it's that kind of feedback that keeps up the quality control. Now, uh, rope tech novelizations. Uh, this is uh, something that's undergoing a little bit of an update. Um, right now, uh, the majority of the new sales is occurring in electronic book form. Uh, one of the things that fans have noticed with the most recent printings, uh, paperback printings of the books, is that the uh, contained appendices, uh, you know, in which we were comparing uh, discrepancies into continuity between the TV show, the novels, little details like that, because a lot of people really do pay attention to that. And so uh, what we've done now is because it's being published in ebook form, we can actually go back uh, to the electronic version of the books and update them as much as possible. And so one, one thing we're doing is for the earlier printings of the Macross books, uh, we are adding appendices to those as well. And also, uh, we're able to make minor spelling corrections, date corrections, and so forth. And even even where we uh, note the date, even where the date corrections are occurring, we're even noting that in dependencies because we know 
how much attention the fans pay to all those details. So it's going to be there, and so it's going to be a little bit of an extra helpful addition for the people who subscribe to the ebooks. Uh, also, uh, this is something that's uh, uh, one of the more recent uh, projects that we're working on is uh, we have the ebooks covering the entire original television series. Now we are working on the ebooks for the expanded universe. So for the fans who wanted their Zentradi Rebellion and the Sentinels, we're working on those as well. So those will be available electronically soon. Um, this is a uh, uh, there were there was some people there was some um, discussion about what is true continuity and not. And one of the comments that Carl makes it gave back to the fans is, uh, it's all very organic. It's different people telling the same story in different ways. And so you're going to expect a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit of differences in the storytelling. And so uh, uh, that's something we can look forward to soon. And calendars. Uh, last year we introduced uh, the 2012 calendar, and now we've got the 2013 calendar available. Steve got, has these to give away, so for those of you who stick around to the end of the panel, uh, you're going to get treated to some of these. And here is a big question we've get, been getting a lot, is Robotech Comics. Uh, the last Robotech comic that had been in print was Prelude to the Shadow Chronicles, the trade paperback edition with the extended storyline uh, was last printed in 2010. And so there were actually a lot of questions, you know, what's going on with the Robotech comics. The license had been rested while uh, the uh, live action film had been in development, or continues to be in development over at Warner Brothers Pictures. Uh, Warner Brothers being the parent company of DC who currently holds the license. However, people, you know, they still want more Robotech stories, and so we had an interesting uh, challenge presented to us uh, uh, for this next project. We were challenged to think outside the box a little and present a story that would be uh, uh, challenging, surprising. And so, how many of you have cameras running right now? WTF moment. Now, how are you doing this? All right, we're not going to put three little band-aids on it. Okay, so uh, it'll be an interesting and surprising story. Uh, we're going to unveil more at San Diego Comic Con. So, San Diego. So, uh, uh, but we're going to have a very public press release about this. So, uh, be on the lookout. Uh, this is going to be a big surprise uh, for you guys. Wow. Okay. So, uh, also, uh, getting back to uh, Mr. Catalogo behind the scenes. I'm innocent. I was in Cincinnati at the time. Oh, actually, I, I was going to talk about your book later, but uh, you covered it pretty good. Uh, I'm going to show them the New York clip. I have not seen this. What? <laughs> so I, you're talking about those New York, New York, New York, New York, 1986. All right. There's a little story about this. Can I just tell a little story? Sure, go ahead. I was asked by the president, uh, Frank Agrama, to go to New York as Rick Hunter, and you know, and and there was a whole bunch of reasons. I, 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 Tony Oliver maybe wasn't available, but before I knew it, I was in a costume with Rick Hunter, which was designed. Is this the same? Is this? You want to save the rest of your story too? All right, I gotta finish this story. I gotta tell you what happened. Awesome story. You didn't finish the story. Oh, all right. No idea. Probably have hair in this You want to see that again? <laughs> Notice how thin I am in this picture. You're still pretty good. Well, I'm after all these years, I'm still pretty impressive. So, so uh, go ahead. Okay. So I agreed to do it, and you must understand. And I tell you this from my heart. I didn't really know anything about Rick Hunter, and then, and the reason is the nature of voiceover. And you guys ever watched? I've done tons of voiceover before Robotech, like uh, Ultra Seven. Zinger Z, if you ever seen that's me. And uh, many times you work in a studio 
with a group of actors, kind of like, you know, uh, Bart Simpson, you know, you all do the voices, but in Robotech, you just go into the studio and you do your part. You never see any of the other actors. So I was doing little tiny parts. So I, I didn't know who Rick Hunter was. I didn't know any of that stuff. But I, they said, you're going to go. And so I went. And uh, so I was dressed, dressed as Rick Hunter. And I'm, you know, I was out there. And, and, and the goal was, as you see, I was supposed to sign autographs. Well, they said, wait a minute. You know, I got to do a New York, New York accent. They said, wait a minute. What are you talking about? You're not Rick Hunter. <laughs> What is this? You know, kind of a thing. So I, 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 I didn't, and Carl was with me, and I didn't know what to do. I said, should I sign it as Frank Catalano? Should I sign it as Rick Hunter? Should I sign? So I, I started signing it as uh, Frank Catalano, and the first day was Rick Hunter. Anyway, and then they had, I think it was the SDF-5, does that make sense? The toys, Matchbox had oh, toys. The SDF one, yeah. They had a big one, on oh, SDF-1, they had a big one, and a, and a big one, and a little one. And so this kid's looking at the big one, and I says, hey, you want to see it, you know? And, I, and he plays with it, and I said, why don't you get your father to, to get you one? And he says, oh, I don't have a father. Oh. So I said, well, then your mama, yeah, my mother, you know, we're poor, we don't have any So I, I said, here, and I gave it to him. It was a little SDF one. And so he looked at it, but he kept looking up at the big one. <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right, okay. Give me the thing back. And I took the big one down and I gave it to him. And the kid goes, get out of here. I said, yeah, get out of here. <laughs> so he took, he's probably, who knows where he is now, living in New York, maybe incarcerated. I'm not sure. <laughs> but that's a true story. And I told Carl, and Carl kept always threatening me that he was going to tell Matchbox and make me pay for it, which they never did. But. Uh, that's a, it's a true story, and uh, it was a weird thing, but the fans in this uh, section that you're seeing educated me starting from day one. They were great. They talked about the show. I got to see the show through their eyes, and I fell in love with the show right then and there at that moment. It was a great experience. Uh, actually, I heard a little backstory on that, uh -oh. um, which was uh, you were a much thinner actor than uh, Tony Oliver was oh. back then. Uh, I mean, Tony Oliver, he's lost a, probably about 100 pounds since back then. So he's in great shape now. He looks much better. Uh, you know, bless his, uh, bless his soul. But, uh, uh, you know, at that time, uh, it was just marketing people thinking, ah, you know, uh, he looks like a smaller, thinner guy. You know, he looks like Rick Hunter. The fans won't know. And of course, the fans don't yeah. always know. Fans know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so this is uh, this is Mr. Catalano's book. Yes, thank you. And 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 part that story is in there. And and the, the Robotech experience. You got. I'm not sure if you guys are aware how voiceover works in the sense that when you go into a part, and, and as I said, I've done tons of these things. If you've ever seen um, the Godzilla movies, done them all, okay? And so you go into a room and you're with a group of people and they'll say, oh, uh, Frank or Fred, play that guy. And I remember uh, God, one of the Godzilla movies, they asked me to be a bridge guard. And so you're sitting there and you're, you know those like little bridges and then there's a cut of the ocean and you hear, and Godzilla comes out, and he goes, ah, ah, ah. and then you have to do it to sync, so you go, hello, hello, because in Japanese, how do you say hello? Right, so the mouth of the actors go, so you go, hello, hello, Godzilla, real word, so you go, hello, hello, Godzilla, oh, is now approaching Tokyo, and then I got waxed, you know, he looks at it, so you do that in a group setting, in Robotech, we showed up at all hours of the night. I'm talking about 2 o'clock in the morning. I think I saw Mick Jagger one night out there. It's in my book. No, because they had this like club called Nikki Blair's next door. And so there'd always be like people walking out, you know, and I thought, you know, it was like Shadow Dancer. What? It was like Mick Jagger or something coming out. Tony Kirk. All these actors would come out. And it was a weird life. But you would go in a studio and you would be all alone. It would be you the director and the sound engineer, and you have a headphone, and you're playing against the characters that are already recorded, and you're doing your lines, or 
you're the first guy on the boat, and you're doing your lines and there's no reaction. So many times throughout the years, we've worked on these shows, but we never worked together. I mean, I worked with Greg Snagoff, you know, Chiron. We're good friends, we're right, we've written together and stuff. And so uh, I wanted to write about that in the book, the unique way you created a character. And it wasn't like, oh, here, you know, when you do a movie, and I've done, since that, I've done, since that, I've done some movies, I was at Warner Brothers for many years. They say, here's the script, and you meet the director, and you kind of talk about it, you know, how are you going to do it. This is how you show up. Maybe if you're lucky, the director knows something. Maybe if you're even more lucky, Carl's around. And Carl would go, oh yeah, and Carl was wonderful. He'd say, oh yeah, that's the such and such, such and such. He'd be walking through the studio, and oh, now we understand what's going on. So a lot of times you had to ingest what was available, and then you had to put in your own stuff. So the character of Rand is based on my growing up as a small New York Italian child in Long Island, New York. So there's a lot of that in there, the scrappiness and all of that. Uh, growing up in Long Island, growing up in New York, you kind of get that. And so that's how we created the show. And then all of us throughout the years have gone on to other careers. Other people have you know, stayed in acting. I, as a writer, have gone on writing. This is certainly not, if you guys look me up, I'm on Twitter, Facebook, you name it, I'm on it. I've got tons and tons of books on Amazon and iTunes and about acting and theater and television and film. So we've all gone on to other careers, but Robotech has stayed with us. There was a, there's an energy about Robotech, and I came to this kind of epiphany that we're kind of like Robotech warriors, all of us, just like the Freedom Fighters. And we're out there, and we're trying to do our thing, and we've all stayed together, and we've all stayed connected, and it's really changed our lives uh, for the better. Um, you know, many years have passed, but we're all still doing it. And I hope you all uh, friend me on Facebook. Is that how you say that? Friend me on Facebook. <laughs> Twitter me, tweet me, whatever you want to do. And I'm there. And uh, take a look at my book. And it's on, a, I, I just did a distribution agreement for all my books with iTunes. So I'm on iTunes now and everything. And I'd love to talk to you guys either today or you can Facebook me and we can talk that way. I'm curious to know what you want to do and, and what you feel. One more thing. Oh, I'm also interested in Robotech, the reinvention of it. And that's why I love what Tommy was talking about. And he knows I have ideas. <laughs> I have stories that I want, you know, ideas that I want to develop. That to take these wonderful characters that were created and take them to new places and new adventures and new times and things like that, and to see it grow, and I hope that we can do that at some point. I would love to write one of those, uh, get some young guy to play Rand, and, and see it grow, and see us all grow with it together. Thank you very much. We're gonna get some other guys. It's only one Rand, man. Well, you know, if they do a live action movie, I want I want to do a cameo, just like have me ride up on a motorcycle or a Vespa <laughs> and say, get a job. <laughs> okay? I hope they do that. You heard it here first. I would love to do that. I would love to do that. And I'd love to meet all of you today, if that's possible. Say hello. And we're going to give some books away today. I, have a I brought, some, brought some of these for you guys, and I don't know how you guys are going to do that part. Oh, with the Q&A game. Okay. Thank you. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, Carl had mentioned that Ram was his favorite character. Yes, because yes. he was the crackpot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as an actor, obviously we're working with already set animation, and the, and the thing about animation, I kind of, you know, kind of glossing over, it, because you could also do live action with a, which they call dubbing. You know, where you're putting your mouth. But you really are creating a character, it's a melding of two ideas. When you get a script in a movie and you're trying to develop the physicality of a character, I'm talking about in a film or a play, you do that. In animation, it's something the physicality is already created for you, and you have to kind of fit into that physicality. But you also bring a lot of your own personality. And certainly, um, in the character of Ran, the kind of snappiness and everything that he had, the kind of irreverent, uh, that's me. And I love the thing about, I love the character of Rand that often all of us in this room today, we're all heroes in our own little way. You know, you read about people that have done great things, but they're just regular people. 
they're not like, well, tomorrow, oh, today I'm getting up and I'm going to do something. This. Rand was just a guy. And he, he was like playing with the invid in the beginning. He was just doing it just to kind of get in their face. And then he rose to the occasion, of course, with a little help from Rook, uh, to do that. And I think we're all like that. And I tried to really connect with that aspect in the character. Make the character a little bit like me. I became a little bit, you know, had the physicality of the character. I'm being from New York, I mean, I don't know how to ride a motorcycle that well. You know, uh, but I, I mean, I incorporated all of that kind of feeling into it, and uh, and, and and when I look at the, uh, I, I had an opportunity to see this film that you're going to see a clip of today, and it really captures. Uh, Greg was directing, and he said, "Come to the studio. I want you to take a look at this." And I it really captures the spirit of Robotech, and I think Carl would have been really proud to see what you all did, what you guys did with it. It's, it's really great. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I may even go to San Diego because you're to get there. Oh yeah, speaking of San Diego, um, regarding Robotech toys, uh, those of you who were in there last year saw them uh, demo a prototype of their next toy that they were uh, working on. Yes, Robotech plushies in the 148 and 1100 scales. So, uh, this uh, with these, uh, you can throw your Robotech toys and feel good about it. Uh, this way, uh, you, and pre-orders are available now uh, on online on the internet, and this way you can play Angry Veritex as much as you want. <laughs> My dog would want that. <laughs> If it, does it have a little squeaker in it? If anyone wanted a squeaker, he would take it and run away with it. Yeah, like a little, yes. Like you And speaking of soundtracks, uh, last year we were discussing about all the work that Steve had put into the 25th anniversary EPs, which included uh, the first edition, We Will Win, and the next George Sullivan version of uh, It's You. Mm -hmm. But we have a new uh, CD coming out. It's actually going to be a double CD set because it's going to contain uh, quite a bit of music. And it's going to be the two CD anniversary collection of The Sentinels and the new music that was composed for Love Live Live. Uh, and also, it contains uh, new restorations of all the Lancer music. Uh, with the restoration of the Lancer music, in which we were able to get the separated stems, we're now going to have the instrumental versions and uh, the, uh, uh, the vocal versions of the original 1985 recordings. So you'll be able to do karaoke uh, with the original broadcast version of Lancer's music. So uh, that is going to be coming out hopefully right after uh, uh, Love Live Live, uh, the two C DVD collection comes out. Uh, this will be this summer. And what's next for Robotech? How many of you follow the trade magazines and rumors about live action, Warner Brother, all that? Now, you, you know that it takes a long time. You know how long Spider-Man took. Spider-Man took forever. Yeah. So, uh, well, we're hoping it's not going to take 20 years, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I guess it's nice to get the option payment from the studio, but uh, it would be even nicer to see the thing on screen. Uh, and the thing is, uh, they, keep, uh, they keep putting the development effort into it. Uh, Warner Brothers has had the production team together for a long time, which is Akiva Goldsman, Jason Edder, Toby McGuire. Uh, outside of being known as Peter Parker, uh, Toby is also well known as a very good producer. Uh, he's uh, produced a, a Sea Biscuit, which got a bunch of Academy Award nominations, and he's had a huge hit on his hand with uh, The Great Gatsby, uh, which did very well at the box office. And uh, the writers, uh, the uh, writers who are publicly named to have been working on the project, uh, range from Lawrence Kasdan, Alfred Gaw, Miles Miller, uh, uh, and Tom Rob Smith. These uh, gentlemen have worked on projects ranging from Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, Empire Strikes Back, to Spider-Man 2. So these are 
uh, top-notch writers that Warner Brothers had been approaching working on this project. But the big question uh, a lot of people have been asking us uh, has been, uh, you know, uh, when is there going to be a director attached to the project? Finally, uh, recently they had brought in a, a, a very talented uh, French gentleman by the name of Nick Matthew. Now, a lot of people have never heard of this gentleman before. He actually comes from the commercial field. He uh, originated, originated as a uh, commercial director. And uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with his work, I, I've actually uh, gathered uh, the, uh, his work from his ad agency. And uh, here, I'll show it to you right here. Uh, 